You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. And my name is Rob. Thank you guys for joining us, spending a few minutes of your day with us. We appreciate it very much. This is episode 1028. Very excited to have you here. Thanks for leaving a review and thanks for asking a question at askdroneu.com. Today's question brings up, I think, a very important point. Uh, because today's question is all about how do you take the right photos for photogrammetry? Because Gary understands very clearly that the input data will affect the output editing, manipulation, and deliverable time. What do I mean? With crappy photos, lots of reflection, sunny skies, harsh shadows, you're going to have incredibly noisy maps. So what are the right ways to take photos for mapping? But it brings up a really important issue. A lot of people, Rob, get into this industry because they're photographers, mm -hmm. creative types, right? How many of those creative types actually think they're technical people? It's a question I ask myself all the time because <laughs> I always thought I was a creative myself and now I realize how technical I really am once I have actually applied myself. So when you hear this question today, think to yourself, maybe there is a good opportunity for myself as a photographer thinking about going into photogrammetry because you need to fundamentally understand photography and the science of photogrammetry in order to be a good drone modeler or a drone mapper. This is why a lot of, you know, architects, surveyors, civil engineers are looking to drone pilots, at least knowledgeable drone pilots, for mapping because the science is part technical, geospatial, part photography, and part just basic systems. So if you don't know one of those particular parts, how do you expect to be successful? Well, on that bomb hmm. show, that is what we are going to be talking about today's on today's <laughs> show. Say, that is going to do it for today's no, show. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, but today's question also does bring up um, a great point. If you are interested in learning more about drone modeling, 3D modeling, or creating highly accurate 2D maps, you've got to consider coming to a Drone U mapping class. We've got one coming up in September the 13th through the 15th in beautiful Denver, Colorado. And the day before that, we have a flight master class. So if you want to attend a flight mastery class and mapping, which by the way, I recommend taking those two together. Anyone who's come to the mapping class, almost 99% of those people could have used time at flight mastery. So if you're like me and you want to create a successful business and you know the keys to creating that successful business is habits, routines, and systems, then you're going to want to join us for that flight mastery class. Join us for the modeling class as well, as we'll cover an extensive amount of detail. It's like a drone mapping boot camp from the basics of what weather and when should you take photos to what types of photos to the acquisition strategy to how does the software actually work to how to create point clouds ortho mosaics how to edit them manipulate them to remove surfaces from your orthos your dsms and your dtms learn the best ways to deliver your models and leave the class with data that you can use to market yourself in your own portfolio it's really easy to go out and market yourself when you have something to show, right? So join us today. Click the link below. Just go to bit.ly forward slash, <clears throat> I believe it, it is Denver Mapping Class. That's right. It's also on our Facebook page, so check it out there as well. But that's going to do it for my little <laughs> stint on the uh, who's sponsoring the show. Hi, Rob and Paul. This is Gary Proctor with Drone Imagery Northwest in Gig Harbor, Washington, outside Seattle. And I have a question that relates directly to mapping, but maybe not in the usual way. I think I have a good grasp on most of the acquisition techniques, but the one area that I think I'm really weak on is the photo part of photogrammetry. I really don't know what I should be setting the camera on. I mostly just use the automatic settings. I don't know what to do with ISO or any other of the settings that you can find. Could you talk about what kind of settings and how you should be looking at your camera in a photo sense for mapping for the different types of mapping and modeling? I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> 
I saw you. I saw you taking that deep breath. Um, For the question, obviously, we appreciate the question very much. Ask DroneU.com for your question. And I'm curious, do you think he's asking this because he's seeing, he's just seeing his models not be what they could be? Or I'm kind of curious what's leading him to even ask this question, or he just wants trying to get better. I'm curious as well, because he did attend the Seattle mapping course, and maybe this question came in before then. But in the class, we actually do have a whole section about uh, image capture optimization, but something that we don't talk about. And this this just goes to show I could just keep adding and adding and adding and adding to this class, because we cover the different types of software. You know, when, when it comes to drone mapping, there are three types of software. You know, the acquisition software, the processing software, and all-in-one cloud processing software. So... By the way, we have a great resource on DroneU.com. It's just the DroneU.com forward slash what dash is dash drone dash mapping dash software. Um, you can actually check out, we, I spent like three weeks and put together a really, 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 really long detailed guide of all this information. But coming back to our limited time in the class, it, you know, we go over how to use Maps Made Easy and Pix4D Capture for acquisition. But something that I don't ever get a chance to talk about is that in both of those applications, it's almost impossible to control aperture, ISO, and exposure. So mm. oftentimes in our workflow documents, you know, we always say, make sure you check your photos before before you leave the site to ensure that they're not blurry, to ensure that they're not overexposed. I mean, this is why, again, overexposure is such a big deal, and so many people rarely think about it. If you look in this image, we're, sit- we're literally sitting on two landing pads right here, and they're orange and blue for our ground control points, because people have never actually gone into the science of how white and black ground control points cause overexposure and a higher projection error for your GCP marking. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> If you really want to be accurate, though, these are questions that you should be asking yourself. Anyway, sorry, I'm going to, like, people don't understand how many layers of work there is to get accuracy. They just think, oh, I'm going to use RTK GPS, and I'm going to get accurate. It's like, well, yeah, well, how did you mark the GCPs? How big was the GCP marker? Where did you put the GCP markers? What was the distribution of the GCP markers? Did you put them at different elevations? What was the baseline from the RTK receiver to the nearest core station? Okay, and then how long did it take to correct? And are you sure you're using the right datum from your GCPs and your photos? And that's the introduction. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) sorry. Um, uh, By the way, I'm sure Gary, our question asker, would agree with me on this because we've talked significantly about this because Gary is a surveyor Mm -hmm. out of Seattle. Yeah. uh, And he brings up a very good question. Which we love, by the way. Yeah. he Surveyors that... Yeah, he brings up a very good question. What about the photos? What do Mm -hmm. I need to do for the photos? First of all, going back to the whole, you know, we could add more to this class. The only application that I've ever seen recently that allows you to control ISO, aperture, and all that is Litchi. You can say, go to DJI Go 4 to control photos. So you open up DJI Go 4, click the setting in Litchi, go to DJI Go 4, set up your camera exactly how you want it. Mm. Now, why would you want to change the camera? couple reasons. Remember, we can only map what we can see. So if like, for example, with KFW, they had a building in San Antonio, Texas that was surrounded by trees and I could not see the wall um, to the door in the front entrance. Now, if you're a surveyor, you know that with photogrammetry, every single corner of the building has to be in a minimum of three photos, hopefully five. So I still could not see back there, so I knew there was no way that information was going to get in the map. So what I did is I took photos manually in DJI Go 4, I bumped up the exposure value and the ISO so I could see back in the shadows of the trees, and I could map that area. Now, while I could map that area and actually draw my polylines and prove to this surveying company that this actually worked, what it also did to my 3D textured mesh is brighten the tree and the building around this area because I changed the exposure. I changed all that information. So this one particular area of the building looked really bright. And you could see a clear line in the grass mm-hmm. where the software took those images and utilized the other images for the rest of the grass. Right. So... Sorry. No, this is great. (laughs) Um, So first of all, step number one, does the application that you're using for acquisition actually allow you to control the settings? Okay, Pix4D Capture, no. Maps Made Easy, I'm not sure anymore. Um, I don't think so. Uh, With Litchi, though, you can. So 
if you know the exposure triangle and you know how to be a good photographer, then yeah, you can set up your photos to minimize exposure because oftentimes the auto exposure does have significant issues and will change the values. Um, in fact, you know, this is why I tell people the best way to get best maps is to really master the weather cycle because in order to get the best maps, you've got to be photographing in overcast weather. You eliminate the shadows, you have more contrast, you can see more. It's more like a natural image like your eye would see. And if you really want to get the least amount of noise out of your models, this is what you have to be doing in order to uh, create beautiful models. This is also why when people, you know, sometimes fight me in class, which is very rare about the whole linear rolling shutter thing. It's like, look, if you want to waste your ha like your day and you want to use a camera with linear rolling shutter, it's going to take you twice as long to fly everything, maybe four times as long, because now you're having to fly in safe mode to ensure that your images aren't blurry. Not even taking to make into sure that the drone is moving slowly enough. Essentially. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah, because it's a linear rolling shutter camera. Right. So, but that it doesn't even like factor in, you know, the processing side, which LRS drones take twice as long to process. So when you have all these people out there teaching, you know, how to how to do drone mapping with linear rolling shutter, um, you know who you are. Um, you're literally hurting departments and hurting people that are paying you money to give you expert advice and you're more focused on supporting the drone company that's giving you free drones. That's something you're not going to find here at DroneU. I'm going to tell you exactly what drone to use. There's a new one coming out for mapping. It's not DJI and I think it's going to blow everyone out of the water. So anyway, there's that. Exciting stuff. So image capture optimization. In the class, we talk significantly about a couple things. One is that First of all, static scenes with simple geometry are going to be really, really good to map. You want heterogeneous surfaces. You really don't want reflective, homogeneous, dynamic scenes that are constantly moving because those are literally going to be impossible to map. So, you know, when, for example, uh, Gary lives in Seattle, which is probably one of the best places ever to map for weather. Uh, I yep. mean, like, literally, uh, I'd be outside all day long, like, mapping stuff. The only issue is the trees, which is why he's, you know... Seattle was probably one of the best mapping classes we've had in a long time. So many great examples of acquisition. And you heard him say, look, I understand the points of acquisition, but what about taking photos? What about the ISO? You have to understand the exposure triangle. And if you're a, a drone you member, there's literally a video from Vic Moss about the exposure triangle. And I think anyone in the mapping class should go watch that video. We need to put, that's a really good idea to put in the prerequisites for the class. That might actually be a good idea. I need to put in the prerequisites for the class, take the class online before coming to the class. No, we already do that. Because the, I know we do, but the people who actually do that, which only represents maybe 10% of the class always, those really? people are like on it. They're like, yes, oh, I get it. I watched that, but I had a question, and now I get to ask that question, and yeah, so. All right, well, we're going to be stronger with the language. Oh, uh, well, it wasn't until I told people don't come to our class with a Mac and without a mouse that people started actually bringing uh, Windows machines and mouses. So Indeed. Anyway, cool. you're going to want to come to a mapping class, though, because as you can see, with just this small amount of information and then having nine hours of it, in order to actually retain that and use it, you need to have systematic information delivered in a practical means so that you go through exercises to learn how this actually works, and then you're given resources so you can take that and use it in the field. If you want that, come join me for a drone mapping class because it's one of the very few times that I go out with all of our students and really enjoy being with students and, and learning and, and teaching with them. So, One of the few times you get the opportunity. But So just to clarify and make sure I understand, what you're basically saying is that it's more because of the software that's used, the apps that are used, you don't have much control. So really your goal is more controlling the environment that you do it in as opposed to the camera because there's not much you can do with the camera with most software. I would say for a large majority of people, what you just said is 100% accurate, but there are people and like, you know, Bill and his NTSB team is a great example where in their standard operating procedures, he's like, I'm going to show you how to fly a grid and show you how to do it without mapping software. Gotcha. And I feel like that's the level that everyone really should be at. I'm you guys want to know how to do it do it like this guy okay but um but no i mean you know with that said yes you can it's better to control the conditions because oftentimes you don't have that control but if you use a program like litchi and you can control it and you know the exposure triangle yes you're going to get better mapping data you're going to have less reflection you're going to have less noise it's going to take less time to process it's going to take less time to edit and manipulate the point cloud to create that 3d textured mesh and to go on from there so are you not going into the details of the answer to the question because it depends yeah 
Okay. I just want to make sure that's clear because the expo- that's why you're bringing up the exposure triangle and understanding it because once you understand that, then you can make the appropriate adjustments to answer his questions based mm-hmm. on what you're actually mapping in. Yes. Thank, okay. And I'm sorry I didn't say that, but no, yeah, no, that's, that, okay. that's, 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 hun- cool. that's that's 100% correct Okay, because it does depend, but even still, if you are able to understand the exposure to triangle, you're using something like Litchi to control the camera itself. There are still variables outside of camera control that right. are going to make your life easier as a mapper, right. which is... Uh, again, heterogeneous subjects, static scenes, overcast conditions. You know, if there there are tactics to eliminate reflection. In fact, I'm testing some of the stuff that Bill recently sent over to me. Hmm. Um, cause what I about think, filters? Do you ever use filters no, for mapping? No, you cannot use filters. Those are bad. Bad, bad, filters bad. Filters bad. Why? You slow down the shutter speed, so then your uh, images come okay. out blurry and they don't work. There you go. <sighs> cool. Excuse me, simple. Um... It's funny, some people, uh, speaking of filters, they always look at our drones and I always take the UV filter off. Mm-hmm. And uh, someone's like, why do you do that? And I was like, I don't know, I just learned after a couple of mapping jobs that for whatever reason I get less noise without this filter on. I, don't, I have no idea why it is, but after just doing multiple data sets with and without, I do it without all the time now. I think that's, I love that because that's one of the magic pills of how you kind of figure all this stuff out and learn it is just by trying it. Mm-hmm. Right? Like experimentation. Empirical evidence Experimentation is that you pay attention to the result of, right? I mean, you got to know the data coming out of it so that you can adjust and learn and so forth. Couldn't agree more. But uh, I love that. Couldn't agree more. On that bombshell, it's going to do it for us today. If you want to join me and have a great experience, have a lot of fun, but also learn a lot, join me in a mapping class. Uh, Denver's filling up, by the way. So good. Not many spots left there, but there are others beyond that if Denver's if you're not able to get into Denver. So we have Denver. We have the NTSB, which is like advanced mapping. Which if you've been to another mapping class. Um, we actually just had two students sign up who had been to a previous mapping class, but wanted to take it up a notch and came to this class, which is awesome. And then after NTSB, we have Austin, right? Uh, no, we go Tampa, Tampa, Austin, San Diego. So East Coast, West Coast, Middle Coast, West Coast. <laughs> that's the idea. <laughs> Trying to spread the love. That's right. That's right. Um, and actually, it's a good time to mention that um, make sure you are subscribing to the show. You're subscribing to our channels. We're going to launch our next uh, Drone You Experience training, which will be going on in Hawaii. And it's seven days of training, everything from business to flying to systems. What we're trying to do is gamify the experience for you so you're out there having to perform jobs. We debrief on that. We give you the workflow of how to do those jobs. What did you learn? All of that. There's going to be five classes and Vic is launching his aerial photography class at this experience training. So if you want to work on your business during the winter, this is something you will not want to miss. The amount of work that we're... I'm so stoked. I actually get to go to this training. So I'm pretty excited. (laughs) I'm excited for you. I'm excited for you. Having you there is always fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So it's also going to be where we are onboarding our new instructors and opening up even newer training centers across the U.S. So... Uh, you know, when UTC stole our thunder and said they had nine training locations and we had 10, but we just never put out in PR. Now we're going to put out in PR and be like, well, we got 25. And well, I'll tell you what, I'm very excited about the, well, the, the foundation of people that we have are incredible and they've been um, doing a great job, but the kind of folks that are approaching us and saying, we'd really like to be a part of what you're doing is really, really exciting. Quality, quality people that you're going to want to learn from. It's amazing when you build culture first. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I, I'm not saying that that was on purpose or that we did that. <laughs> I'm just well, saying that... Well, I think there was some intentionality to what we've done. For sure. But wow, the power it has. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. On that for bombshell, sure. it's going to do it for us today. So thank you so much. And uh, we will be seeing you soon. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>